are needed across the Board of Governors, providing crucial inputs uh, to work on financial stability, bank merger analysis, and many other topics. RNS is also an ongoing source of specialized information for policymakers. If board members have questions about even the most arcane workings of some aspect of the economy, and trust me, we very often do have questions, uh, they can send an email and in no time be sitting down with some of the best informed experts on that subject. Much of the time, these are RNS economists. For example, during the pandemic, when questions arose about how the computer sh uh, chip shortage was affecting auto production, or how businesses were responding to the backlog at U.S. ports, RNS gave detailed briefings on these novel subjects. Among well, its other activities, sure is the, the audio Board of is one of the world's most productive the economic research institutions, and a large yeah. share of that work yeah, takes place RNS, mm -hmm. supporting our mission of promoting a healthy economy and a strong and stable financial system. I've talked about research. Let's talk about statistics. In addition to gathering data from many sources outside of the Federal Reserve, RNS is itself the source of some of the most important data on the economy and on the financial system. Our consumer credit data provide financial markets and the public with a vital indicator of the strength of household spending and balance sheets. Each month, the Industrial Production Report gives us insights into how well certain sectors of the economy, especially in the manufacturing realm, are operating. RNS is also responsible for the financial accounts of the United States, a quarterly compendium of assets, liabilities, and transactions for segments of the economy. And every three years, RNS produces the well known Survey of Consumer Finances, a premier source of detail and insights about how households are faring in the economy. The latest survey was published just last month. These and other data series produced by RNS amount to a significant public service. So I, I want to. So it's important to note, guys. Everyone's expecting a lot of volatility. A lot of volatility this morning. This is not an official rate decision from the Federal Reserve. Now this is hosted by the Fed, but this is more informational and educational. So they're going to be talking about data. They're going to be talking about how they measure certain stats. This is not going to be policy decisions. They're, these people work for the Fed, and so they're not going to be asking them the tough questions. You're not going to get fired by asking your boss tough questions on a live stream that could crash the economy. So in all fairness, I think that we're going to see a relief bounce because, you know, there's nothing happening. There is no negative news here. Uh, so all in all, bullish momentum is still holding on stocks. NAS 100 is still holding that bullish momentum. Granted, it's, it's slowing down. So if we break above or if we fail to close above 15,340, so if we see a massive spike up, and then it comes shooting back down, then I'm going to start taking shorts at 15,340 and looking to short this thing down. If the market pushes up a little bit at the market open and then comes back for a retest at 15,280, if we reject through that zone and close back above, I'm going to be taking that buy position. So I'm trading smaller time frames. I'm on the one hour time frame here for NAS 100. And so this is going to be a 45 minute trade, a scalp or an intraday trade. If it doesn't move before this, uh, whatever it's called, the speech or the conference is done, then it'll most likely be in the second half of New York session. So we're going to find entries in the uh, near the market open, and then we're going to be able to hold them through the second half of New York. And yes, guys, I dressed up today. All right, I dressed up. I figured Jerome Powell was speaking, and so I'm going to put on the I'm going to put on the white shirt and get proper. So. This is not what you guys are usually used to, but trust me, it's still me behind this. It's still me behind this. It's still me. All right, don't worry. Let's get back to the nerd the, the nerd speak here. Even in relatively calm times, the economy frequently surprises us. But our economy is flexible and dynamic cool. and is subject at times to unpredictable shocks, like a global financial crisis or a pandemic. At those times, forecasters have to think outside of the models. A dominant aspect of the future path of the economy is high uncertainty. As so, this work also takes large doses of both courage and humility. And finally, judgment. To complement this rigorous process and these qualities, there has to be good judgment based on knowledge and experience. So uh, uh, to close, to wrap up, perhaps the most important legacy of the past century for the Division of Research and Statistics is the resilience, the creativity, the energy, the rigor, 
and the commitment with which RNS has risen to the many challenges that it has faced and that this nation has faced in that long span of history. So on behalf of the board and the FOMC, thank you for that and hearty congratulations on your first 100 years of service to the public. Thank you. Oh, this is the centennial, this is the 100 year anniversary of the Fed? 2023, oh my God. Oh, that's crazy. Maybe this might be a big deal. We'll see. No Q&A. Who else is it? Is that member Waller? Page. Morning, everyone. Um, it's good to see you all. Oh, no. I am delighted and honored to be moderating this first panel today. I want to begin by thanking the Division of Research and Statistics, or put better, thanking the people of the Division of Research and Statistics. Here at RNS, and I... Yo, is someone's microphone unmuted? Yo, Noah, can we get the mic muted up, my guy? in everything I've done in my life. Oh, since. I thought I was hearing things. Uh, I learned, of course, how to analyze economic conditions and think systematically about what might come next. I learned how to write about economic conditions. We got some new members in the chat. Welcome, Carlos. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Bianca, two-step. Bobby's in the house. Casey's here. Desi. Desi. Gabriel Sands. Yo, Gabe. What's popping with you, bro? See, Karan, Janae, Josh, Max, Mo, Noah, Bert, Roman, who? We got a full house here today, guys. I'd love to see it. Uh, to this is not a Fed speech. Of... I know everybody hopped on thinking that there might be a rate decision. No, no. They're just fucking around. There's going to be nerd speak. They're going to talk about statistics. They're going to talk about, like, look at the crowd. This is who they're pandering to. So I'm really not expecting that much volume. Probably won't take a trade just based off of how the market is reacting at the open. Really not much action here so far. Yes. Uh, and that's all my introduction. Now we're going to turn to um, the topic uh, for this first session. We have three authors uh, next to me here, and you can read about them in the, in the brochure. Uh, they're going to tell us about the role of RNS in research. All right. Spoke too soon. Market just opened. We're starting to see that uh, market open volatility. So I'm going to keep an eye out for this pullback to 280. See if we can get a potential uh, buy from down here. Great. There may be some uh, some sell positions above the 15,335. Let's call it 15,340. Above this zone, there's probably some sell positions waiting. So if the market crack or shoots up here and then fails to stay above that zone, it starts to wick back under. I'm going to be taking shorts at 15,340, shorting it back down to the lows of the previous Great session. Yes. Um, so this paper is about, if I can advance the slides. Are you advancing? No. Oh, maybe not. not. For a second. Okay, there you go. Um, we're we're going to look at... Um, the role of re RNS research, uh, basically, as it pertains to Fed deliberations around monetary policy, financial stability, and regulatory issues, and we're going to look at how uh, the role has evolved over time. Um, as we were brainstorming this paper, uh, we were thinking about the importance of research, and of course, research is important because it informs policy decisions, but we also realize there are all these other spillovers. It pushes the staff towards greater rigor. Um, it helps attract an excellent staff. Uh, and then to the extent that you're putting it out publicly, it increases the credibility of the Fed by illuminating the science behind policy decisions. Uh, so the paper has three parts, and we're going to tag team the I'll talk. Um, I'm going to start with a brief overview of the history of research in RNS. This is about to be so boring. Do you guys do you guys even do you guys want to watch this? Because I'm gonna watch this later. Like, I'm a nerd. I'm gonna watch this later. But this is like this is about the the most dry shit that we're ever gonna experience. The science they're decisions. They're having a coworker happy hour. Right now, or you mean after this? <laughs> Not right now. So after this, bro, nobody's showing up. Bro, they don't even do anything. 
<laughs> all of their data comes from I, I don't know, bro. This is fam. The CPI metrics have changed three times in the past three years. Like these, they don't know how to analyze this data. I'm going to tell you guys right now, most of the accurate information they get is from the private sector, private sector, commercial institutions, like the commercial banks, JP Morgan, Bank of America, they're spending so much more on technology, on data, on uh, acquiring talent to be able to come in and give them an advantage in the market to be able to provide them with real-time updates on the metrics that affect the economy like CPI. So yeah, I don't know. They're, they're just out here kind of tooting their own horn. They're celebrating a hundred years and let them have it. I don't want to be the Scrooge, but let's be real. None of this matters to the markets at all. Historical record that the decision-making at the top really- We'll have it going though, just in case, just in case they slip up and say something that's uh you know, we'll see. Uh, it was really war considerations that do dominated the story. Um, monetary policy wasn't that interesting because it was all about keeping borrowing costs low for the U.S. government. Uh, but the staff was engaged in a ton of war-related analysis, both to help the board, but also to help other agencies in Washington. Um, and then you have the 1950s with the uh, Treasury Fed Accord, and you're back to kind of more normal. Whoever was asking about Euro USD, this thing is looking really good. Granted, we still have a little bit more room to go, but. Oh, wow. Hmm. I don't know, something something tells me that we have one more push down before it continues bullish, but we've already broken back into the zone. So we kind of we had this massive bullish impulse above the range. We had this flag retracement. First area of support, the market closed under, but now it kind of looks like it's recovering. What I would do is I would wait for the next few candles to form to see if it comes down for one more correction. You'll have one, two, and three touches. That third touch is going to be money. Oh, that third touch is going to be money. Where's the 78? That's a little too low. Where's the 70%? I'd say about 1.065. 1.065 would be ideal. Finish off the flag retracement. Then you have impulse, retracement, continuation. This would be nice. Is the DXY still falling? The DXY is rejecting right now. Let's see if it rejects. What did I have drawn here last week? Okay, so we've already had this pullback. Yeah, this is make or break. If the dollar continues to drop, then we'll see Euro USD keep pushing up. If uh, the dollar recovers here, then we can potentially short EU. Let's get back to NASDAQ, make sure we don't miss the market open though. Inflation, which Jeff will talk about in a few minutes, um, that just engendered more research thinking, uh, thinking about forecasting and so on. Uh, so this decade was um, characterized by Jerry Ensler in his oral history uh, interview as um, just a really spectacular buildup of intellectual capital. Um, so then kind of subsequent decades, you see this, um, uh, ongoing trends towards more focus. Up I'm looking at some potential shorts here as well. We just rejected the 88.6. We're at a daily sell level. So for my chart addicts members, what I did was I drew a Fibonacci from the very, very top of this range to the bottom. We're sitting at the 88.6. So I do expect a retracement from here from this daily high to the daily low, or we can even see this as a weekly, but from the daily highs to the lows, there's a potential correction that uh, at least I haven't seen on the daily yet. On top of that, we had the market open, price broke above the Asia session range. You guys know I like to sell outside the Asia session range. And now we're rejecting the 886. So let's see if this trade is worth it. Stop loss above the wick, take profit. Almost back to the bottom of this zone. Got way too many levels here.
almost a two to one risk and reward. Not the best R and R, but still, you know, still a worthwhile trade. It's still a high probability trade. We have this thin red line up here is that daily 88.6. And then this one right here, this is just from uh, New York session highs yesterday down to the Asia session low. So just this little retracement measured it. And then we've corrected about 90%. If I entered at these higher prices, I can get a two and a half to one R and R. So I may take those odds, may take those odds. Because if I wait for the rejection, it'll probably be too late. All right, let's see some patience here. I'm gonna give this just a few. See what they're saying. We focus on three questions. Oh. First, uh, how much research is produced in RNS? Second, how is research produced? And how is research used? And we're gonna give you a sample of some of the perspectives that we get into these questions. We are not. Uh, I did want to break this down for the people who are on the NAS bootcamp. I mean, and for the basically everyone who's watching. Had I entered just off the 88.6 with no rejection, no confirmations, uh, that would have been a nice two to one or two and a half to one. If I entered now, for example, I'm not saying I am, but if I was to enter the trade now, I'd have a four and a half to one R&R. &R. Now it's three to 3.2 to one. The more that you wait, for a rejection, the more that you're looking for additional confirmations, the further that price gets from that entry. And uh, yeah, we end up paying the price for it. So if you want the best R and R, sometimes you're going to have to take the chance, you know? So uh, that's what I'm looking for is just a little bit more of a push up. I might take the short position. I'm going to layer my trades. So I'm not going to enter one big static position. I'm going to do five lots, 10, and then 20 if we push back up to this level. So let me go in here. Take this. For a short, that was 10. And I am going to give it some room to the upside. Three sixty five puts us about 30 points. What is this? That's 20. So my stop loss is at 15,350. Sell entry is at 15,320. And obviously this is not the best entry. If we push back up just a little bit, I, I would like to get a, an entry at 15,335 or 340. But this is what I said at the beginning of the call, which is 340 was the area that if we pushed up and then we could not close above, we started to reject. That's where I was going to take shorts. And so that's, uh, you know, and there is a story behind it. That's what happened. And let me turn to the first question so. and to get a glimpse of the amount of research that is produced in RNS. We're plotting the number of new publications per year across uh, the major publication types uh, we have here. Are they flexing how many publications they're dropping versus the effectiveness of the Fed policy? Publications. And all of these have increased over the past 25 years. We can uh, explain some of the wiggles in, in this chart, some of the other wiggles uh, we cannot explain. One that we wanted to share with you today is the significant increase in the late, uh, in the mid 2010s in other publications in, in the uh, green line. So a lot of that increase owes to the introduction and the consolidations of Fed's notes. This has been a very high demanded uh, outlet. It has a wide reach. And which makes it very appealing. And it also allows for a strengthening of the partnership between economists and research assistants who in this product can uh, work on the, on the same uh, lifespan of the paper as their tenure uh, in the division. We, we looked um, at the increase in the number of publications a little bit deeper by decomposing the number of publications into the number of economists and the number of publications per economist. This is an oversimplification of the production function of research, uh, which is very complex and has evolved over the years. Obviously it includes uh, the partnership of economists with research assistants. It includes uh, data and technology. And we've heard a lot of the importance of those factors 
in earlier days of this uh, week. However, this decomposition is insightful in that it uh, shows that the increase in publications in RLS owes both to an increase in the number of economists and an increase in number of publications per economist. Uh, let me turn now to the next question about how is research produced. We look at two angles of that question. The first angle is how is the research output distributed across economists? And for that purpose, we are plotting here the fraction. All right, so we're getting a nice rejection. Uh, we'll, let's give it a second to see if we get a follow through. Once price comes back to touch this zone, I'm gonna be securing partial profits and uh, moving my stop loss into a break even, letting this thing ride all the way to the downside and then starting to look for long positions at my 1020, you know, that my, uh, my session that I'm looking to trade. I am looking to protect this trade very soon not because like not because i'm just trying to uh protect the trade but because i'm trading against the trend whenever i'm counter trend trading i make risk management a priority and part of making risk management a priority is understanding that you're trading against the current and so you have to make uh smarter not smarter decisions you have to make decisions based off of risk management first don't sit there and try to maximize profits especially if you're doing something like counter trend trading other divisions and other economies working in the institution. However, it's very illustrative because it allows us to use maps. And <laughs> yeah, on the left, we have the earlier part of the sample. On the right, we have the later years. And this chart is illustrating that the network of co-authors has become denser and wider. So in the later part of the sample, there are more collaborations with places that were collaborating earlier in the sample in, in the US and across the Atlantic. And in later years, that 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 bread that network has become more dense, and it has expanded to other continents, including uh, countries in the rest of the Americas and Asia. This is likely not uh, only uh, something that is happening at the board. This is likely a reflection of a wider trend towards globalization of research and the emergence of research centers in all of. All right, I moved my stop loss back to the highs. Uh, I put it just above the, the wick, but the market hasn't finished retracing yet. I don't want to just get kicked out of the trade and have to enter more orders. So I just moved it back up for now until this candle corrects. If it rejects back down, then I'm going to move my stops to break even. If it continues to be bullish, then obviously the trade is invalid, but I was able to minimize my risk at least. We've already gotten a nice rejection here, but uh, that might be the market open rejection. This might be the break retest of the 886 and continuation you know sometimes when the market is aggressive especially on the bullish side uh the five minute ranges is really what it's respecting i'm gonna look at the 30 minute zones that's my priority i'm not gonna take low probability trades just because the market is moving so for now i'm gonna sell at that premium hold this thing and see if we get that follow through in the next 20 30 minutes ours uh in this chart which is illustrating that research mentions have become more frequent over time. Obviously, some of some of those words may not reference economic research the way we understand it when we're writing an economic paper. So we wanted to understand a little bit more of the context in which those references were made. And to do that, we use uh, the most common words in Fed's working papers. We classify the 100, the top 100 most frequent words in Fed's working papers, excluding grammatically common words like prepositions, for example. And we ended up with a with a list that sounds uh, very much like uh, things that an economist would do in writing an, econ an economic paper. For example, we have words like data, estimate, model. And we're trying to understand how frequent are these economic words around research references in FOMC documents. And that relative frequency is what we're plotting uh, in the bars in this chart. So this chart uh, combined with the previous one is suggesting that the output of economic uh, analysis is becoming more important as an input into policy deliberations. But uh, perhaps more than these abstract examples, uh, some of uh, these abstract um, charts, uh, some examples are going to really uh, hone in this idea and that's what uh, Jeff has prepared for us. And with that, I turn uh, to Jeff. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I got to tell you, it's an incredible pleasure to be here. 
Um, I'm going to make remarks that range from, and they'll be brief, but they range from uh, computing battles in the Fed, which I remember fondly. Okay, computing was an important part of my research, so I'll touch on that, ranging from that to relationships. So let me start with the relationships, because the reason I look so forward to coming here today is not so much about presenting this paper, although I, I really enjoyed working with Karen and, and getting to know Gustavo, who frankly did a huge amount of work for this, and I'm really grateful to him for that. It's to see all of you folks who I met 40 years ago. I mean, in some cases, um, th that means an awful lot to me. Maybe, it's, maybe I'm just getting older, but these reunions mean an important. And, and, and look, the institution is nothing without the, you guys who have been here, who dedicated your lives to a public mission, who worked hard, and along the way had some fun, got to know each other, shared a bunch of stuff, whether it was computing or something else. So I just wanted to say something about that, because that, that really is really important to me. I'll get into the substance of the paper now quickly. I do want to say that in the course, relate, a related comment, in the course of researching this paper, going through the oral history and interview, interviews, the transcripts, other documentation from way back in the history of the Fed, it was wonderful to bring back to life some folks who I had not seen in a long time, some of whom have left us. So Jerry Ensler, Ed Edden, Peter Tinsley, um, the, the list goes on and on. Those are folks who are my mentors, friends, um, pillars of the research community here, folks who are responsible for building up the research community into what it is today. I'm closing my original entry and break even. I'm going to hold the better entry for now. Oh, never mind. Give this thing a second, see if it comes back in. But I'm trying to close my original entry and break even and then hold this uh, this better entry up here with a better position. Need to see a rejection back down, which we might not get. Keep in mind, guys, bullish momentum is still in. So this thing might just rip through, and then we'll just have to wait for the market reset. But uh, now I'm taking the trade. Price is, there it is. So I just closed my first position and break even. And I can afford to do that on FTMO because I'm not getting charged any commissions. So entering multiple positions, it's not going to cost me any more uh, than holding one. So really, there's no, there's really no downside to it, as long as you're using proper risk management and not over leveraging the account. Okay. I got a bad feeling about this. I got a feeling that bulls are just going to completely blow through the zone. So if you haven't already entered this, to be completely honest, wait for, wait for those, uh, wait for those longs if they do come. I think that buyers, buyers are showing their hand. They really want to break through this level. And uh, I believe that they will. Other folks were in the thick of this in ways that I'll very quickly talk about. The big lessons here are just that throughout this institution's history, there's been a really healthy interplay between research, between policy, between developments in the economy, between measurement, how to measure the things that we're trying to understand and, and what, what's going on in policy. And it goes both ways. We were sometimes staff here we're leading the charge in terms of understanding how the economy works and how best to pursue monetary policy. In other cases, we were learning from folks outside about important developments in theory and empirics that helped us do our jobs better. That interplay is all over the place, and some of the examples are listed there. Um, okay, you know, obviously, the you may have read about the rise in inflation, this inflation in the 70s, 80s. You may have read about this. It was kind of a big deal. What's interesting to me, so I went back to reread, I actually have a bound copy of this in my um, library, the Econometrics of Price Determination from 1970. This is a really interesting volume. It really is. And the Fed is not the only participant there, but they're right in the thick of it. And in the midst of that discussion are concepts that are being wrestled with. And in the case of Bob Lucas, who contributed to the volume, put forward for more or less the first time that grad students today are talking about, right? This is what we learned. This is what we thought was important. Well, that was real time, real world policy challenge and economic research interacting. And the Fed was in the thick of it there. Jerry Ensler was one of the contributors to that volume. Expectations, they've come a little a little ways. Uh, and not that I think we know everything we need to know about expectations just yet. But you know, it used to be we kind of, there, there weren't really present in some models and then they were kind of there in this really ad hoc way. And that was discussed in this volume among others. And then we started to get more serious about it. And then we adopted rational yeah, expectations. I'm trying to mute this, I'm trying to mute this guy. Opinion. Guys, I'm going to close out of this trade. Exactly this is the right not way looking to do good. things all the time. Uh, Where is... St that stuff was going on at the Fed in RNS 
uh, all the time. It's great to go back and read the transcripts from the early 1980s, and Dave is in there in spades uh, trying to explain to the, to the well, I don't, that's not quite fair, but trying to give the staff's perspective on how to think about inflation in the wake of that large disinflation episode. And I think the staff did actually pretty well in that, in that case, using a model that I've got there. I'm going to run out of time, right? Yep. <laughs> but it's been fun. Yeah. So I, I, I'll then just touch on the zero lower bound and then we'll, we'll wrap up and, and move along and we can hear our discussions. There was a really interesting conference. I was part of the organi organizing team, but there were a bunch of people who worked on it. 1999 was in Woodstock, Vermont. Found it. And inflation had been coming down. Looked like it might settle somewhere in the two to two. All right. Honestly, I'm kind of tired of listening to that. Really not much happened in there. Uh, yeah, it's starting to look like uh, starting to look like buyers are taking control. We're filling this wick to the upside. We've already seen a break above these highs, and it just looks like bullish momentum is taking over. I don't want to say this is rare, but it, it is pretty rare for the market not to at least retrace back into the, the Tokyo range. So this could either mean that bullish momentum is just very aggressive or that the retracement just hasn't happened yet. And typically, the retracement will come after that 1020. But the fact that uh, you know we're at the 88.6, the location of the current price makes it more attractive then waiting for this. I think that if the market makes it back above the zone right here, it's going to continue to the upside. Just like we saw yesterday. I was waiting for the pullback, never came. Rough week. Rough week. And analytics um, to sharpen the discussion is a big. It's a really a big deal. It's not the only thing, and we can be misled. Uh, some sometimes in the way that medicine, I think, is misled by its incredible imaging technology. That said, medicine doesn't understand how a lot of things work. Not that they aren't working on it. We're sort of the same way. We've got pretty good technology now. Do we understand how everything works? No. But an important part of improving the way we could analyze the economy and provide that sort of advice to our principals. So that's kind of it. I mean. It's fascinating to see, and Karen touched on this, the evolution and the role of research and RNS in particular over its history and how it contributed to policymaking. Really fascinating. It has come a long, long way. It is probably not done yet, um, but I'm proud to have been a small part of it early on in my career and proud to be co-authors with these guys on this paper. Um, I learned a lot from that, and I look forward to our discussants' comments. Wait, let us thank Karen and Gustavo and Jeff for a terrific paper. I do encourage you all to read the paper. It is fat. Ain't nobody reading that. And um, but we do want to press ahead, so we have time for uh, some Q and A after the discussions. Uh, and our first discussion, John Roberts, was right here. There you go, John. Thank you. So I want to uh, thank the uh, organizers for inviting me to have this opportunity to uh, to talk to you all and to discuss this really really nice paper. So. Um, First of all, this is a terrific paper. Um, it's got this. It's got uh, the narratives that we uh, that we just heard about. The use of data that Gustavo talked about. Uh, it's if you wanted a paper on research in RNS, this is exactly what you would have wanted. I think um, students of central banking are going to find it very useful. Uh, it sort of pulls back the curtain on an important process within a central bank. Um, you know, how has the, the Fed made use of its economic staff? And then I'm gonna take a deeper dive into one of the issues that the paper raises. It's this one that um, got mentioned a couple of times, this idea of spreading the uh, research resources more, more even. Well, this is actually pretty interesting stuff here. It's talking about how the Fed actually does their data collection and how they use the Fed's economists, which is apparent they're supposed to be some of the smartest and the brightest. So this is going to give us some insight as to how they really look at this, as well as some of the problems they're having internally. Um, 
I really like that fact-based analysis in the second section, um, withdrawing on this data from the, from the research library. And we just saw some good examples of that. And then the case studies that Jeff was just talking about, um, really interesting uh, examples of um, how research and policy interact. I'm back on. I'm back in profits on uh, the NAS 100 trade. So now that I've gotten the rejection, and now that price is back inside this range, and this is not even the range. I don't even know how I drew it like this. I mean, ideally, I would like price to come back to 15,300 in order for me to uh, put my stops and break even. But the fact that we just got two wick rejections tells me that I am ready to protect this trade and then wait for the longs. So smaller time frames. Market dropped. We already had the rejection back up. So that would have hit our first break even, which it did. But you know that's why. Luckily, I moved the stop loss in time, and then there was another rejection, and then now we have this release. So I feel like the market's already come up enough times to grab liquidity to the point where we're ready for that release. Uh, obviously, the market can come back as many times as it wants, but typically you want to wait for the retests before moving stops to break even because the retests are inevitable. Uh, another good reason to get wick entries, but even if we got this wick entry. If we have moved it to break even, we would have still got hit here. So waiting for those corrections and then moving your, your stop loss to break even is, uh, is a pretty important skill. Now it's up to the market. We're either going to go up and fill or we're going to drop into the buy zone. I kinda, I, I'm kind of on in favor that buyers are just going to continue to push up. But obviously... There's only one way to know, which is to be patient and to let the market show us its hand. Let's do things this way. Um, the last time I checked, I don't, don't follow it closely, but the ECB had separate uh, research and economics departments. And it was it's clear that most of the research resources are in the research department. So a very different way of doing things. And I th as far as I can tell, other divisions at the board seem to take kind of a hybrid approach right, where special studies or study sections still exist, but all economists are encouraged to do research. So sort of in between, although I think closer to the RNS model. Um, so, you know, in the narrative, I would have been interested in hearing. Juan, I'm using a swing account. That's why I can hold trades through sessions and trade news. That's also why I'm using bigger lot sizes than what some people may have maybe expecting, because it's only one to 30 leverage on the swing accounts. All right, we just came back into the zone right here. I'm going to take partial profits, and then I'm going to allow the market to do the rest of the work this here. This decision made, what, what was the analysis, sort of the pros and the cons? The experiment seems to have been a success, you know, based on the, the information uh, I want to get that a little bit more of a push uh, down to fill, this, to fill this way. So, uh, you know, the data presented in the paper suggests that uh, research uh, per economist went up, not down, as the change was being implemented. You know, a fear might have been that with asking uh, uh, staff to do both their analysis and research, maybe the research would have gotten crowded out. That turned out not to be the All case. Right, I just secured and the profits. research that was being produced uh, appears to have been useful to policymakers as the case studies uh, illustrate and as the, the data show as well. So just a quick review of, of some of those data that we just saw. Um, the steady rise in publications. Here I'm focusing on the blue line because that's kind of the, the, the academic uh, Bro, I'm falling asleep here. <laughs> All right. And I love this stuff, but uh, just I really wish they would speak English. Everybody, if you took the trade, let me know. Shout out your entry. If you close the trade, break even, let me know some results here just so I can have a general idea of where everyone's at. I'm new to Forex. Welcome, welcome, welcome. What the hell? What the fuck is this nerd rambling about? <laughs> You're funny as shit. Uh, while live trading indices like U30 NAS, there's a particular website portal that shows real-time details about companies or latest news that you do. I mean, bro, I'm literally showing you my system live. What about anything that I just did makes you think that I'm on a third-party website looking at the performance of these companies in order to take this trade? I need you to kind of explain that, that process. 
I'm I'm literally on here for free showing you my strategy and my system from start to finish. And there's people like, yo, do you do something that's not even on the screen right now? That's something that's unrelated, that's completely different, that's not relevant to anything that we're doing? It's like, bruv, paper trade this. If you're if you're out here, paper trade this. Figure out what just happened. Study. This thing is uh this thing is looking good right now. Looking good. I'm gonna hold off on the longs until we have a break through the London session low and then through the Tokyo session liquidity or the Tokyo session lows to grab the liquidity. And then I want to get a push up. So let's be let's be patient here. I want to see this thing probably come down even to the discount, like probably halfway in this range here. 15,270. Let's talk about that here in just in just a second. He said, what the fuck is this nerd talking about? Hey, man, chill. Those are my those are my economists. Those are my people. Uh, RNS is thriving. Um, there's a lot of it being done. Uh, it's appreciated by policymakers. Um, so it looks like this this idea to spread the res, uh, resources out uh, more evenly was a good idea. And then to sum up, this is an excellent paper. Um, it's going to prove to be a great resource, I think, to students of central banking. And as, uh, that last um, exploration suggests it provides plenty of food for thought. So thanks very much. Thank you, John. I, I took all my partial profits. So everything that's still running, which is like a minuscule part of my position, I only have two lots running out of the, the original 15. So I've cut down my position over 90%. Whatever is running is extra credit. If this thing melts to the floor, I look like a genius. Why? Because I have a wick entry and the market did all the work. But realistically, the market was responsible for that movement. Personally, I'm still bullish on this. You know, even though I'm seeing this double top form, I am still bullish. We did have this rejection. Okay, so there was bullish uh, momentum pushing up. We had a closure above the previous high, which shows that buyers were willing to bid the price into a new range. And then now we're forming this higher low. So what I'm personally looking for is for price to go through the Tokyo liquidity so I can buy it up. So granted, I did take the shorts. Whatever is running is uh, extra credit. I forgot about the trade already. Now I'm resetting and I'm looking for potential long opportunities as long as I get all the confirmations. I'm not trying to give back the money I made on the shorts. Most of you should not take another trade because most of you have not been profitable. And a big reason for that is you don't know when to walk away. So if you walk away in profits, you're going to make money. Now, personally, I have my bias. I'm trading my system. I have a really, I have a very specific trading plan that I'm following. All these different things, and I'm able to hedge myself in and out of trades. And so, when you guys see me taking trades in opposite directions or taking multiple orders, I have a risk management strategy that protects my account, and I have the technical skill set to either hedge myself out of a trade or to minimize the amount of, you know, the amount of risk that I'm exposing myself to. Long story short, if you made money, walk away. Don't be a gambler. You're at a casino got the chips, put the chips in your pocket on the way to the chip cashing, you know, the, the desk where you go and cash in the chips. There's going to be all these attractive ladies saying, Hey, you're sure you don't want to come back and play another game. Why? Because they want you to give the money back. And so this is the equivalent. If you made money, don't give it back. It's not rocket surgery, people. Why, why is that always doing yard work, bros? This has to be the well, most well-kept garden in all of fucking Florida. This is ridiculous. You guys ever, you ever seen this shit? It's a fucking starting up. I don't even, I'm not going to do it. I took the trade at 15,344. I just got it at break even, waiting to reach the discount. So later I can take the buys. Well, hopefully you take some partial profits so you can at least walk away with money. Because this thing is going to shoot back up. Once it hits this, uh, once it hits this floor, and if you didn't take any money out, you're just gonna be looking goofy, and you're gonna be very upset with yourself, and that's where a lot of uh, bad decisions start happening. Uh, Tushar just woke up. The f what are you talking about? Break even on my shorts at US thirty. Oh, what's up? Welcome to the stream. Do you ever enter? 
trade in Tokyo London session for indices? No. Andy Unlimited says rocket surgery. Yes. It's like rocket science and brain surgery. Those are the two hardest fucking things that you could think of. Someone's like, bro, but where do I, Roy, how do I access the NAS 100 boot camp? I tell them it's not rocket surgery. Click the link in the description. It's that simple. Uh, he says, Roy the goat. Lino, no goat. I fit the description. I'm going to leave that up to you guys. Not a goat. He says, damn, who deleted my account? Uh, if you were being a dickhead, probably somebody on the team. If you were not being a dickhead, please let me know. Because we're not out here trying to, we're not, we're not on some censorship shit. I just really don't fuck with losers. A loser being defined as somebody who comes onto the streams and just has negative energy. is not productive. Damn it. Guys, I got bamboozled. We hit the 88.6. I didn't even realize it. So I had my Fibonacci drawn from here to the top of this range. So it was like here. If I adjusted it to the new New York session high, we actually just hit the 88.6. Okay, which means that that was the entry. Now, because I don't believe in uh, fairy tale stories, I'm going to wait for one more push through, grab all the liquidity, and then continue up. So more than likely, we're going to come back down to 15 270 like below the 277 so 15 270 and then let's see if we can get a retest ladies gents if we don't get this retest this thing's about to fly okay this is what happens when you're trying to be too accurate okay this is what happens how much how much is this three point seven points i'm out here about to miss the trade of a lifetime because I was trying to squeeze the last three or four points, trying to get the quick of quick entries. Despicable. So that's why when I tell you guys body to wick, it's because when you're too accurate, you're going to pay the price. Now, granted, I've been trading long enough to know ha, one rejection and then just a straight line up. I wish. I wish I wish the markets worked like that because then I'd be making easy money every morning. Well, I mean, we kind of do. This morning was a little stressful on that drawdown. I'm going to be honest with y'all. But I don't believe in fairy tale stories where the markets move in a linear fashion. Markets move in waves. And so on the smaller time frames, there's waves of impulses, retracements. Okay, so then we have an impulse. After the impulse, there's going to be a retracement. The retracement might be halfway back inside the range, or ideally for us, all the way back to the bottom of the range. For my NAS Masterclass folks, this is everything that we've been talking about. Every single thing that we've been talking about has just played out in one very simple fashion. And you were all witness to this. And you will all be a witness to this when I fucking hammer this in tonight on the last and final day of the NAS 100 Masterclass. This was a well thought out trade. I appreciate you sharing your mindset with us, Roy. Duba, I appreciate you giving some genuine feedback here. Roy, George from Greece here. We met at the summit. Appreciate these lives, mate. George from Greece. The security guy? I had a, I had a uh, there was a personal security. He was from Greece, if I'm not mistaken. The guy was a fucking tank. Apparently he was a Green Beret. Is that you? I don't think that, I don't think that Green Beret George would be on YouTube though. Yeah, I was going to say someone my, different. Yeah, my For boy sure. has a Nokia phone, has a Nokia 1120. Boy, that shit not that shit's got the fucking burner, boy. <laughs> yeah. My man too busy eating babies to watch your streams, bro. Yo, shit. Yo, that, <laughs> just, that dude was scary, bro. No, I think it might have been a different George. I think when somebody stood up, uh, Jason might have stood up and asked, where's everybody from? And there was folks mentioning where they were from. Who's the furthest out? We had Greece. I believe that that's Greek George, the guy who stood up and said, uh, or who raised their hand and said uh, they're from Greece. But I think James... Our own member, James, was the person who flew out the furthest for this summit. He came from Guam. Now, most of you don't know where Guam is. And up until the, the point where James told me he was from Guam, I did not know where Guam was. So I had to look it up. It's fucking far. He said, bold Greek guy, good looking. 
This motherfucker. This man just wanted to plug himself. He said single, great credit score, Greek, six foot one. But this is not Tinder. Oh, he's fucking giving us the Tinder description. He said Greece here too. Yo, shout out in the chats where you guys are from real quick. Give me city and country. Give me city or country. Let me know where you guys are from. Uh, patience pays, y'all. Patience pays. I will only take the trade if we break through the liquidity, if we grab liquidity from the Tokyo session lows and then recover back above. Upon the recovery, I'm going to enter the first trade. Let's call it 15 lots. And then upon the retest, I will enter a second position because I'm a savage. All right, clearly respecting my risk management rules because risk management is the priority. If you're not using proper risk management, even if you have the best trade ideas, if someone had this trade idea that I gave to him right here and had you over leveraged, you may have panicked and closed out in drawdown. Plain and simple. So you could have had a great trade idea and because of the over leveraging, you got out and then missed the relief. So it's important to have that level of patience, y'all. It's important to understand the strategy so you have confidence. And then once you have confidence, because you've seen it so many times, it's important to have the patience necessary to let the trades play out. Yo, can one of the moderators take a screenshot of uh, the chat where everybody's from? I'm, try I'm trying to figure out where everybody's, like, you know, wh where we at with it. I'll actually do it over here. And the strategy, so you have what would you? Uh, that was all the phases right there. Walter, you already know. All right, so we got uh, Greece, Lima, Ohio, Phoenix, San Diego, California, Anno, Leosia, Greece. That sounds exotic. Montreal, London, Houston, Texas, South Africa, Cape Town, McAllen, Texas. We got South Africa, a couple Indias. Oh, shout out to my shout out to my Indians out there. Shout out to South Africa, Detroit. All right, you mentioned a city in Honduras that I can't pronounce. And because you put me in a spot to mispronounce that and make me look stupid on the stream. All right, last minute, I'm gonna take that as a sign of disrespect. But I'm gonna still try because you tried to you tried to play me thinking I wasn't gonna pronounce it correctly. I'm gonna butcher the shit out of this, but I'm still gonna say it. Teg oh no. Teguchi. No, my God. Teguchigalpa, Teguchigalpa, Honduras. Tegucigalpa. But it, no, he's going to have to move. How about that? He's going to have to change locations and change, just change zip codes so I can pronounce it because I'm not doing that one again. Utah, Venezuela. Utah, Venezuela. But are you playing a trick on me or are you fucking with me? We have Brisbane, Australia. Shout out to Australians. Uganda. Shout out to my Ugandans out there. Look at that entry. Uh, Trust me, we can all see it <laughs> clear as day. And if you're not impressed, I don't know what to tell you. And if you're slightly impressed, drop a like for your boy. It would uh, it would mean a lot. All right, we got India, Haiti, Nigeria, California, South Africa, Zim Zambia. Oh, shout out to my Zambians. We got Cape Town. Shout out to my South Africans. Botswana. Oh, my God. Puerto Rico. Yeah, we mad international. Yo, should we do an African tour on this world tour? What's going on here? We got Azera in Nigeria. We got Haiti, New York. Haiti, New York. Jay Olivier, we about to fight, bro. You got to stop fucking with me. India, Somalia. Yo, shout out to my Somalians, man. This is crazy. Uh, Rancho Cucamongo, California. Oceanside, Cali. Dominican Republic, Miami. Missouri, Lesotho. We got people in Lesotho too. This is crazy. Kinshasa is the the Republic of Congo, the Democratic Republic of Congo, DRC. Kinshasa, Democratic Republic of Congo. Yo, good looks. Appreciate the appreciate the the correction there. Your friend said it right. My friend said it right. Yo, golly, they're saying you're mad cultured, bro. This is what they're saying. He said, "Finna make Roy kick his ass, bro." If I can't make you, if you're gonna make me pronounce some shit I can't understand, I'm gonna take it as a sign of disrespect. He said, uh, Roy is too smart for this game. You're out fucking with me. Kenya Umojing. Umojing? Why does that sound Japanese? I, okay, now I'm just generalizing. I'm going to take a step back. What's the best way to calculate risk for FTMO accounts? 
uh, which website slash application? Uh, that's a two. I don't use a lot size calculator, bro. I don't know. Palestine. Oh, shout out to Palestine. We got Remedow in Palestine. Yeah, what's the sitch? Give us an update. Remedow. Thanks for the trade idea. And y'all better not start whiling in the group. Y'all better not start whiling in the comment section. All right. My boy is just mentioning where he's from. Y'all start whiling in the comment section. Everybody getting kicked. It's gulag. So chill out. Thanks for the trade idea. Roy was able to uh, was able to pay for my breakfast this morning with that cell. Jaden Flores, I love to see it. What do you have for breakfast is the real question. That's what we all want to know. I'm sure that's what we're all wondering is what did Jaden have for breakfast that he paid for using this NASDAQ trade? Yo, there's 160 people on this stream and yo, you guys don't want to drop a like for me? Like, what have I done? What have I done to you? That would make you so, that would make it so antithetical for you to drop a like, even though it's a low effort activity, even though you're about to grab your phone about 30 times by the time I finish the sentence. And even though it would mean the world to me, you guys won't want to drop a like? That's madness. He says FOMO in the like button. There we go. Do not FOMO your account, but FOMO the like button. Oh, 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 I'm about to just. Guys, I'm about to have a new phrase. It just came to my mind. I might be a genius. We're going to full margin the like button. No, don't full margin your accounts, but you guys can full margin and smash the like button. You guys can over leverage that like button. Full margin it to the moon. One to 1,000 leverage on the scam. Oh, do you guys want to have a conversation about what's happening in the industry? Under one caveat is that I will only answer specific questions. So if you guys are like, Roy, what's happening? A lot. But if you guys want to talk about what's happening in the prop firm or the broker space, let me know and uh, I'll cover specific questions. So if you're like, hey, I saw this on social media that somebody said this. Is it true? Is it not true? How does this work? What's the future of this thing? And then I'll be able to really uh, provide some quality feedback. French toast with eggs and sausage, the whole nine. Bro, my boy had the full American breakfast. So, yo, your comedy, you got me rolling. Bro, stick around because now that the trading is done, uh, not much for me to do but sit here and literally just be hilarious as many of you know that I am because it's either that or we listen to a bunch of decrepit Fed economists discuss a bunch of shit that doesn't fucking matter. You're going to print money or not. If you're going to like wake me up, this is my, this is the only reason I put so much emphasis on the FOMC press conferences is because there's a rate decision there. I'm basically asleep over here. Like wake me, Jerome, wake me up when you have a rate decision. You're going to print money. You're not going to print money. You're ready to print money. Wake me up. You're not printing money yet. Okay, cool. We can start to look for these shorts. It's that simple. They're like, oh, well, we're changing the metrics and the the uh, DEI score of our motherfucker. You got one job, print or don't print. Let us know you're going to print or don't let us know you're going to print. Give us a heads up. That's your only job. So wake me up when Jay Pizow has a fucking real announcement for us. Like, hey, recession is here. I'm getting ready to print. My expectation is that in the Q1 or Q2 of next year, we finally hit a recession. Housing market finally feels the crash. Prices finally come down so we can buy some houses, right? And then upon that crash, the Federal Reserve is going to panic because the world is falling apart. We can't afford a recession. And they're going to save us from the recession through money printing. It's that simple. And then when money printing happens, risk assets fly to the moon. And uh, yeah, if you're holding risk assets, such as stocks, crypto, etc., yeah, you may or may not see the benefit of this next bull run. All right, we're officially at the 886. This would have been my entry have, had I not been a little bit skeptical of this market action. What I want to see is a clear break through this zone. Just, just rip through. Rip through and then recover because I feel like... Uh, I don't know. This thing still has some steam. Granted, fuck, it's right at the entry zone. Had, like, guys, because I made money on the first trade, I'm not too eager to jump in this one. Had I had this been any other day, I would already be in this trade. I can almost guarantee you, not even almost, I can guarantee you, had I not already been in profit, 
I would already be in this trade. So here's what I'm going to do. When price comes back for that inevitable retest, I'm going to start to scale. So I'm going to do my 5, 10, and then maybe 15, but I'll probably just cut it at, now I'll do 15 down here. So I'm going to split up my order. So I'll go one, two, and then three. Beautiful, perfect rejection. So both trades were ultimately successful, but obviously we have to have some patience to see if uh, if the buys are going to have the same reaction as the sells did. Granted, I still want my entry, so please come back. Baby, come back. You could blame it all. No, no. No, no. Took that five-minute M pattern from the, do from the top on down. Well, Jurgen28. Are you in the boot camp by chance or the master class? It kind of sounds like you are. Do you think we're going to go into a recession? Lino, great question. I didn't even read your question, but I answered it. Do I trade Forex occasionally when there's a good swing trade idea? Why are people hating on Lambo Raul and Hero FX? Uh, to be honest, I don't know. What are they saying? Bro, TP about to smash. I mean, brother, TP already smashed for me. I told you I'm already out of the trade. That running position I have is all extra credit. So let's make sure that we keep that as a... Uh, I'm out of gold shorts with 60 points. Good shit. They are just stalling the inevitable. Okay. I'm guessing you're talking about the prop firms now. Matt Charts just launched his own prop firm. What's your opinion about new prop firm coming out onto the scene? I am in the master class. Beautiful. Jurgen, 28. I hope you saw everything that we've been talking about from the pre-session consolidation to selling at premiums to from top down. This was the 88.6 right, to taking partial profits at the 61.38 in the previous lows, to the box strategy. I hope that you saw everything in action today and that you're satisfied with the information that you've learned so far in the class. Can you use the same NAS 100 strategy with other markets? Yes, of course. And if anybody is in the NAS 100 master class, after having learned the past three days and having seen this trade right now, what can you guys say about the strategy and what can you guys say about the quality of the education in that class? Would you recommend it to everybody else that is currently on stream or would you urge them not to waste their money? Which one? Okay, so Matt Charts launched his own prop firm. First things first, uh, Matt Charts is my boy. So take that with, you know, take that into consideration. And I like the guy. I think he's pretty, pretty bright and he, he actually knows a lot about trading. New prop firms coming on the scene are taking on a risk that I think is very obvious to all of us. If the big players are under fire, if my forex funds just uh, just got indicted and they're facing they're facing criminal prosecution in Canada, you have surge trader whose uh, their spouse was involved in some money laundering operation here in Florida about six months ago. They they got a letter of cease and desist from the SEC. So you see the top five ten names getting in trouble. And you see that the way the game works is that the top five names basically own a lot of these smaller names that come up. And so like, it's just a rebrand of an, another broker or another prop firm. Oh, I might be missing the trade. Hold on. I wanted to break liquidity one more time, but I'm going to enter the first trade here at 280. And then I'll enter a few positions below that zone so I can get a better r and So... If the big guys, if all the big prop firms are under fire, it's possible for us to assume that all the smaller guys have zero chance, like to, you know, to really make it. There's a lot of paperwork. There's a lot of legalities. There's a lot of compliance. There's a lot of licensing that's required to legitimately run these operations. And most of the people who are entering this space have no fucking clue what any of that means. 
And so, yeah, if you're going to put your money on a pro on a platform run by individuals who have zero experience running a financial services company or having any sort of financial services registration or licensing, you have to take full responsibility for all the money that you lose because the choice is yours. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the securities license manual. This is just the first book that I had to read just to get my series seven license, not the series 66. On any given page, I can, or on, uh, sorry, this is actually the 66 book. I grabbed the wrong one. But on any given page, I can open this up and I can name something about running a brokerage or running a prop firm. And then there are probably some violations based on what we see in our industry. And I need you guys to genuinely understand that I'm not digging at anyone specifically because the people that are talking shit on social media, they all have an agenda, right? They all have a broker link in their bio. They're talking shit about all these unregulated whatevers, but then they have a broker link in their bio. Nobody is talking about the reality of the situation. So on any given page, on any given chapter, let me just open this up. Regulations of investment advisors, regulation of broker dealers. Okay, great way to start this chapter. Look at the look at the depth of these questions. Okay. The first securities corporation, so this is like the name of a company that they just made up is a broker-dealer registered in State A, the location of its principal office. So you have a broker-dealer that's registered in State A, and that office is their principal office. Because you can have offices everywhere, but it's not your, your principal office, which is where your business is registered. I'm fighting for my life right now not to enter this trade. One more grab through. So I'm going to enter the first position here and start to scale in. Oh, my. So my first position is going to be small. And then if it goes into a bit more drawdown, then I will enter subsequent positions. Damn. I just missed out on. I was like 10 points late just because I was talking. Oh, my God. So 280 is going to be 250. That's 30 points. That's about 30 points. Yep. Okay. So trade one is now complete. Trade two is in motion. Nice rejection here at the 15 to 80. And uh, I'm still expecting one more push through. So don't don't panic when this happens. This is why we always put a small position first. That way, if any drawdown happens, there's no type of like, all right, just let it be. But let me let me finish reading this question. We have state A, we have broker dealer, and then the principal office. They begun doing business in state B with First Fidelity Bank and another company. And they open a small branch office in state B to service that account. This is a broker that is registered in one state that's now doing business in another state, don't let alone another country. Which of the following statements is correct? Now, the, the list of questions, the correct answer is that the this original company, the first securities corporation, the one that had its principal office in state A, they got to register in state B now because it's, it has a place of business in that state. So jurisdiction, liability, and licensing. Registration with the state. How many... Of these firms, do you think have a legal structure that's adhering to all of these rules? This is page 43 of the fucking book. This book is 556 pages. That is one question, one sentence of one page of this book. If I keep flipping through this book, how many violations are going to be there? So Y'all can start doing your own. You guys can You guys can play this out. And in case you guys don't know, I did hold a Series 7 and a Series 66 license. I have, I was a registered broker dealer in the United States. I was a broker, a legal broker. And I was also an investment advisor. So I could legally give financial advice and recommend specific investments and specific securities to my clients. Which if I told you right now to do something like buy this right now, that would be financial advice and I can get in trouble. I'm not doing that on these streams, by the way. 
I'm showing you guys my system and how I trade live and allowing you to join me as I trade live while I provide context, education, and answer questions. But if I was to provide you a specific uh, investment name and I said, guys, Apple is going to blow up, buy this right now, or you're an idiot, buy this, do this is the best thing for your, for your life, I can get in a lot of trouble. Now, because I, I held a Series 7 license, I was able to legally give financial advice and legally give specific securities recommendations to my clients. On top of that, I was able to execute those trades on their behalf on the open market. Granted, I had to call them almost every time and get, uh, you know, read disclosure forms. Uh, granted, they had to sign a bunch of, you know, liability paperwork to say that I was allowed to trade on their behalf and they gave me power of attorney and things like that. So there's a lot of responsibility, regulation, and risk that is involved in being a broker. How much shit do you guys think I would have had to put up with if I took on an international client? Because I did took I did try to take on one, and I tried to get them enrolled for about three or four months. Could not do it because of that much pay. We had to register in, in different jurisdictions. We had to ask. We had to get so many different audits of their paperwork. The accounting between jurisdictions is so different that there wasn't a way for us to verify certain assets. And so when you're talking about brokers registered in another country, servicing all clients from all countries everywhere, and you're expecting your money to be there forever, you're expecting your money to be there when you wake up in the morning and log in, you have this expectation that it's supposed to, the money's supposed to be there. I don't think that you're really living in reality. And I don't think that you're truly accepting the full risk. Drop a like if you guys learned at least one thing from that. Just drop a like on the on the YouTube if you guys learned at least one thing from that. Roy, does shift in sentiment signals a shift in fundamentals? No, no. A shift in a sentiment is how people feel, right? Guys, guys, I think that uh, I think it's gonna rain, and everybody's kind of walking around like shit. I'm expecting it to rain. That sentiment is fearful. That's the sentiment. The fundamentals is, is it raining? And if it's raining, how many inches? And if, how many inches? How much is that compared to last time it rained or last year? So the fundamentals is quantified. You can measure it. You can touch it. You can feel it. Sentiment is more about the vibe, right now. Right now, the vibe is the party's rolling. Right, the bulls are just buying it up. The party is 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 rolling. The bears are sitting here. The sentiment on the bearish side is. Guys, I don't know about this. I see a crash here soon, but they don't have any any real say in it. Bulls are the ones with the full kind of like, that's the narrative. And so the sentiment right now is risk on. People want to invest in US stocks. They want to get their money out of Europe, out of Asia, out of Africa, and plug it in here. I like this as soon as I entered. 10 steps ahead, man. Yep, yep. Hey, Roy, why don't you use a limit order? I don't need to. Like if I was... If I was not on the stream, I would already be off the charts. I'd be back at the gym. I already went to the gym today. I'd be back for round two just for fun. Not really for fun. I got shit to do, but you guys get the drill. All right, ladies, gents, quick reminder for everybody on the YouTube that we host one masterclass every month. It's a three-day program, very intensive. We are offering a fourth day now because we needed the extra day. A lot of you that are taking the masterclass now, please give me a, your one out of 10 rating just for the folks who are watching this. If you guys are interested in learning this NASDAQ 100 strategy and learning to do it for yourself, make sure to register for the NAS 100 class. The link is in the description below. If you missed the registration for this one, the next one is going to be in December. If you guys missed the cutoff for the December class, we will not be doing another class until the spring of 2024. The December NAS class will be the final class of like until the spring of 2024. So if you missed out the first two classes, I'd highly recommend you guys not miss out the December one. Looking forward to changing a bunch of lives and showing the strategy to as many people as possible. And don't take it from me. The folks that are in this chat are giving their feedback as we speak. Small accounts, whoop, whoop. Small accounts might face a drawdown at, on that entry looking at 15 to 20. Well, small accounts should not be trading NASDAQ in the first place. So I don't know how that's relevant. Uh, thank you. Very valuable. Masterclass is pure gold. I took the first round. It's 11 out of 10 for real. Big Noah. Good to see you on here, bro. Juan Rodriguez. Good to have you on, bro. The masterclass is totally worth it. Which broker are you using for your personal account? This is the FTMO swing account. So 1 to 30 leverage swing trading allows you to trade news and allows you to hold trades in between sessions. 
Look at this hedge, guys. Look at this hedge. We got buys at the bottom, and we got sells at the top. I'm getting ready to enter another position here. Two fifty eight to two eighty. Two eighty to two fifty four is thirty points. Where's the previous lows? Yeah, we should be good. Don't mind that. Don't mind me. Just making some last minute adjustments here before I hop off. By far the best class you'll take. Roy simplifies it. Love it. Autobahn says 10 fam, still allowing the ideas to soak in. Yep. What's the most to have in a trading account to start trading indices? 1K. To be honest, with the advent of prop firms, I can never see myself going back to trading personal accounts. But if I am going to trade NASDAQ, at least 1,000. And really, I would say a bit more. I'd say probably 1,200 to 1,500. Because the thing about the, that I realized with my own psychology, maybe this is not true for you, but when I go from nine thousand, from when I go from a thousand to nine ninety five, when I go from a four figure account to a, a three figure account, it starts to make me feel like I'm in drawdown. Like I start to I start to internalize the drawdown for some reason because I can't unsee it. But if you're at fifteen hundred and you go down to thirteen fifty, you can still have the confidence to know that you know you're still in the game. There's no material change in I don't know. It's all perspective. It's really our perspective. If you don't have, if you're a psychopath and you feel zero emotion and you just want to trade this thing mechanically like a robot, then I'd say probably a minimum of $1,000. Okay. And with that, you're going to have to use the smallest possible lot size to avoid over leveraging the account because you may be risking $50, $60 on a, tr uh, on a trade. So if you're using a micro lot size on a, on a uh, you know, on a broker that has a 0.01 as the smallest unit that you can trade indices, then it's going to be every point that it moves is going to be a dollar. So if you have a 30 pip stop, like we have right here, or 30 point stop, excuse me, 30 point stop is going to be $30 of risk. If you're using a 0 0.1, it'll be $300 of risk. And if you're using a standard on that account, it'll be $3,000 of risk. Y'all get me? With the FTMO swing account, it, like every 10 lots is the same as a 0.1 on the other broker. So it's important to look at how those lot sizes affect uh, or how they change and how they vary based on the platform that you're using. Uh, Got to hop off, but using your system could have easily caught that sell on NAS. If it hit your premium, minimal drawdown, Roy simplifies it. Yep, yep. What is your max loss in terms of risk to reward per day? Uh, usually it's about a quarter percent to half a percent. Usually I'll do a quarter percent per trade. Sometimes I'll take two trades. If I If I lose one, take the other. But I try not to exceed half a percent on any given day. And if I get to half a percent, I'm usually a little pissed. So I prefer the one percent. I'm oh, sorry, quarter percent risk per trade. What is your max loss? Okay, flipped 1,000 to 3,000 just trading indices and gold, but it's just risk and reward because they move so quick. I mean, just because you flipped 1,000 to 3,000 doesn't really mean much. You can blow 5,000 on the next trade. So understand that. Risk management is the utmost priority, regardless of how much you've been able to flip. You do have to be very, very disciplined because it only takes one day to blow an account. That's the reality of trading is that most people don't realize it's not about the strategy or the systems. It's like, dude, you're going to figure this shit out. I promise. And you're going to be profitable for five weeks in a row. And then one day on a Friday or a Monday... You're off your game. You start over trading. You're in this emotional state and you just you self-destruct the account. And so what I try to do, especially because Chart Addicts primarily focuses on personal coaching, one-on-one, -on -one, because in order for you to make the progress you need, you can't have a cookie cutter system. I can give you my trading strategy, but you have to learn to tailor this to your personality, your risk, your risk tolerance, and your schedule. Maybe you can't trade the 1020 to 1120 session because you got to be at work. But how do you take advantage of the systems and the strategies based on, you know, your own personal? So what I'm telling folks in coaching is that I'm not really worried about you on the good days. It's not about the days where you're okay or the days where you're just, you know, you're taking trades. You don't overthink it. It's the days like yesterday. Yesterday, I was so off my game, took a shit trade, was kind of was kind of like just really, really off my game. If I had not done the work, which is the introspection looking inside so that you really understand yourself and then having the discipline and the experience to be able to walk away in time, I may have done something stupid to my account.
because I was I was a little bit mad that I had taken the wrong try. I'd entered early and sort of and all these things. So with that being said, figure out those things that could self-destruct your account in advance. Don't wait for the gunfire to start to figure out your, your strategy. Figure out what you're going to do so that when it starts, you're not caught with your dick in your hand. Okay. Hope that wasn't too graphic. Or maybe it, maybe I hope it was so the information sticks. Come on, people. This is real life. How did I get such a shit entry? Oh, it's because I was out here rambling. I was like, dude, I, there were so many great, great entries down here at 72 and 63. 63 up to 83. That's another 20 points. This thing's already, that trade would have already been in deep profit. Not deep profit. You guys, relative, relative. We, we would have had a chance to close a, a clear one and a half to one r and Have a good rest of the day. Right back at you, bro. Make sure you guys drop a like before you hop off. Uh, hit up boxing training. Vincent, you mentioned boxing. In, you mentioned boxing in front of me, bro. You're going to have to throw up the hands at the FX Summit. FX Fight Night coming to a city near you. Uh, when is your next master class? It's December 5th. The classes are $350 for now. Because I'm in favor of raising the prices, if I'm going to be honest. I, I just don't feel comfortable giving away something so valuable for so cheap. But I understand the reason we made it so cheap is because I know that there's another layer to this. I'm not going to pretend to sell you guys a dream that once you take this class, you'll never, you'll be good for the rest of your life. Because in reality, you still have to practice. You still have to apply the strategy. You still have, and this is what I'm trying to provide here as a free resource. So we did make it cheap for the purpose of allowing you guys to understand that this is not a silver bullet. It's going to cure everything. But at the same time, I also don't feel comfortable making it that cheap anymore because I'm like, what the this is my baby. I've spent years and thousands of dollars learning the strategy and really just becoming good at it just to give it away. Yep. Uh, but we will have a promo code. Let's actually do a promo code. Golly, do we have a promo code already for the December class? I'm going to make a not. promo code. All right, let's do a promo code called early bird. 25% early bird. And if you guys register with this link, this is going to be probably your best chance to get in. So this is only going to be for people on this stream. The link will expire in 48 hours. Whoever watches the recording of the stream later, if they make it this far into the stream, let's be honest, they deserve it. They deserve the promo code. This is going to be a two hour stream once I'm, once I hit, you know, once I end it. So the price is already at a discount by the way, guys. Uh, so I'm getting a double whammy here this morning. What do you mean? It's already to... at a discount? We're raising it a hundred bucks next week. Oh, damn. Well, y'all heard it. Don't fuck this up, people. He said, click the link. All right, for the rest of you guys, I'm about to hop off. Uh, my session ends in about 25 minutes, but I'm not really interested in being here and sort of watching candle by candle. The only reason that this trade would get negated is if we closed below the discount. So if we close below 15.265, get out the trade. So we don't even need a stop loss this wide, if I'm going to be honest. If the market closes below here, the reason I want to leave it wide is because we could wick and then shoot back up. But if the candles close under, just get out. Not right away. If it closes here, wait for the pullback, get out and break even, and close the buys. Because this thing is about to melt. Okay? So identify the closure, the shift in momentum. Identify potential retest zones. Try and close by mitigating your risk. Try to close and break even so you can mitigate your loss and then allow the market to do the rest of the work. Um, do I think that's going to happen? I don't know. I don't predict. I just perform. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your host, Roy Junior. I'll catch you guys every single morning, New York market open. And of course, happy and safe trading. Peace. Uh, no kidding, but your energy in these YouTube